The first thing I want to do is talk about sort of what types of NGOs you can expect to see when you go to the field. And you can define them very broadly into four different types. The first would be um, international organizations like the United Nations, um, or in on the continent of Africa, we have the African Union, IGAD, the International Intergovernmental Authority on Development, ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States, SADC, the South African Development Community. And these are usually political, uh, political, political or economic unions, and there'll be some internationally mandated function, either by the nation states that are part of the region or down from the UN. Um, you'll find development NGOs, and these are uh, NGOs that work to improve long-term living conditions, like health, education, um, medical care, human rights, civil rights, democracy. Um, you'll find humanitarian aid NGOs, and these are most, in, most often involved in emergency operations, feeding people in the wake of a uh, natural disaster or in the middle of a conflict. And a fourth kind is advocacy groups, and this is mostly research groups that will come in, look around, make an opinion, and then go up to Congress and tell Congress what they should be doing, or tell the United Nations what they should be doing. This is groups like Human Rights Watch, um, International Crisis Group, Refugees International, people like that. But you can also define NGOs based on where they, uh, where they are based and where they operate. Think of um, international non-governmental organizations, INGOs. Uh, they have a global presence. There'll be organizations like Mercy Corps or CARE, Human Rights Watch, the International Crisis Group. They're, they have international staff based overseas overseeing local national staff. You'll have regional organizations. We talked about them a little bit under the IO category, but this would be ICAD, ECHO, WAS, and these are regional political unions designed to ease communications or harmonize commercial traffic in the states. You'll have national organizations, only operating within a single country. Um, when you think of civil society within any nation, start here. These are groups that operate, they might be human rights advocates, or women's groups, lawyers committees, any nationally based group, and they're usually completely staffed by foreign national working in the country. I'm, but, I'm sorry, local nationals, foreign to you. Local groups, and these are even a smaller footprint, they might work in only a region of the country, um, or even in a city. They're the smallest of civil society groups, and they're often completely off the radar. Um, there's a number that we've got where people say there are 3,700 NGOs based on the continent. I don't know where that number comes from, but I've seen it a lot, and I can't imagine how someone would actually go out and count all these organizations in all these different countries. Imagine that the civil society groups at the local level probably aren't counted. You might have, you'd have all the international groups, the national groups, the regional groups, and maybe a few of the well-known local groups in countries like South Africa or Nigeria, where there's a big, or Kenya, where there's a big international presence and people are actually counting these things. I think 3,700 is a very low number. And when you think about civil society at the lowest level, within the town, within the village, within the city, those groups probably aren't counted. But they're really important to understand that they're out there. They are fully integrated into the community. But not just that, they really are the community. These are the community leaders. So working up from there, local, national, regional, international. You can also sort of look at NGOs as being either operational or non-operational. Operational means, in a, in, in, in a situation like a conflict or a natural disaster, is this organization providing food, providing shelter, providing medical services? Are they operating in the country? That's an operational NGO. Think of somebody like the International Refugee, uh, IRC, International Refugee Committee, is that it? Uh, International Red Cross? ICRC is, 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 the ICRC is an international organization, but they're also, International Rescue Committee, yeah. uh, so, yes, ICRC is actually both. They're an international organization and an international NGO. They're doing two missions. ICRC Care, Mercy Corps, Catholic Relief Service, people that are building refugee camps, bringing in food, providing medical services, these are operational NGOs. Non-operational groups are gonna come in look around, make an opinion, and go back and tell Congress of the United States what needs to happen. More like the International Crisis Group, 
Refugees International, Human Rights Watch. They're not providing services to people. They're not putting in a water sanitation system. They're non-operational. So those are the base, that's the basic breakdown of sort of who's potentially out there. So I was asked to talk about two words, collaborate <coughs> and compete. And the answer is yes, they do both. Think about this mostly in terms of the international non-governmental organizations. Groups that come in with a mandate from their funders, approved by the government, come in and provide a service. They have to collaborate with other organizations on the ground, and they also have to compete with other organizations on the ground. So collaboration in one way, think of it as from the policy standpoint here in Washington or at their national headquarters, and then think about it in the field. And there are organizations that work as sort of umbrella groups to help the, or to help the NGOs collaborate here in Washington or in their international arena. There's an organization here in Washington that's called InterAction, and it's a, it's a group of 190 different international non-governmental organizations. InterAction represents all these organizations to help them, I'm gonna read from their um, mission statement, which says, seeks to shape important policy decisions on relief and long-term development issues. We talked about humanitarian aid and development NGOs, humanitarian aid, coming in during an emergency. That's the word relief here that they use, relief and long-term development. Development being much more long-term, helping to raise the level of uh, development inside each community. So Interaction does both. Including foreign assistance, which is code for government money, the environment, women, health, education, and agriculture. So they try to cover the waterfront. They try to work on long-term development programs stuff that USAID might be involved with. They try to work on emergency, I mean big USAID. They try to work on emergency aid programs, stuff like the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance that USAID might be involved with. And you know, when hurricane, when, when the earthquake hit in Haiti, that's an emergency. Emergency development, I mean emergency relief NGOs go in there. That coordination on the ground is handled by an organization that's called OCHA. OCHA, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Activity, the UN office, and it helps organizations on the ground figure out where are the gaps, what needs to be covered, so they don't end up, everybody doesn't bring in the same number of tents, and somebody forgets to bring all the, the medical supplies, so that food arrives on a schedule and help and gets distributed, so that not everybody's covering the same issue, you know, the sexy, the big sexy issue, People have to come in and work on water sanitation, which is not sexy, but people die if it doesn't work. People have to bring in food. Some organizations in the field really are experts at logistics, at moving food from one place to another. Um, some are really, really good at water and sanitation, and OSHA helps sort all of this out in the field. So coordination, collaboration in the field, OSHA, collaboration on policy issues, think in the United States, think of interaction. Interactions just based right up on 16th Street. Um, let's see what else. Ah, U U.S. government interaction, small i, with the NGOs. A lot of that happens through interaction. NGOs do approach the U.S. government, State Department, DOD, but interaction hosts a lot of task forces and forums to get the non-governmental organizations into the room and sit down with Department of Defense, with the State Department, with USAID, with other governmental organizations, so that there's a continuing conversation back and forth. In a place like Afghanistan, this happens with a small community, and I know that when General McChrystal was on the ground, he set up a, um, a basically a small interaction task force of local, local NGOs, international NGOs, and the military, all with through ISAF headquarters, to get people to sit down and talk. This happens here in Washington, so if you work at DOD, and if you happen to work in the office of the Secretary of Defense, and you're one of those people who's tasked with working with the NGOs, US in, uh, the Interaction and the US in Institute for Peace will be your two best points of contact, the best place to get in. Um, let's 
Interaction also reaches out to COCOMs. They have a, t a group of people that go down to each of the, 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 the major combatant commands at least once a year. They send groups out to work on major training events at UCOM, at, the, at the, uh, the Army War College, certainly I don't know if they do it here, and with um, Southcom and CENTCOM. And I think they're, they're trying to reach out to PACOM, but I, I think they're having trouble getting people that really want to go out to Hawaii in February. So we'll see how that works. Um, so they do cooperate, they do collaborate, but they have to compete as well. Maybe you've heard the economy stinks. So there's not a lot of government money. There's not a lot of international organization money. And there's not a lot of foundation money. And I think all of us are feeling that, you know, maybe we might not be able to give as much as we would like to individual charities every year. So money for these big operations, money to buy tents, to buy food, to buy water sanitation pipe, to move people around the world, to buy all those big white land cruisers that everybody drives around in out there, all of that is drying up. And it's very, very difficult to get the money that's needed. And so you, that's why, you know, once you've given money individually to one of these NGOs, you're on their list and you keep getting that appeal every, every month, though, the poor, the poor baby with the big belly and the big eyes. Yes, they're going to hit you with that because the money's drying up and they have to compete for it. That's just one way that they compete is for funding and donors. Um, I don't really know of an NGO that's operational that has stable funding. I think that there are a few foundations that have stable funding, people like the, the Open Society Institute. If you've got George Soros's money, you have stable funding. They fund a lot of NGOs. The Ford Foundation, but that's not an operational NGO. CARE, Mercy Corps, they don't have that, those big bank accounts to rely on. They get money from the government, from the United Nations, from individual donors. So there's no stability in their funding. So there's this huge competition. And as much as they collaborate, they also have to compete against one another. It's a very sharp competition. So how do you get this funding? You do outreach. Think of it as advertising. Look at all the great things that CARE, or Mercy Corps, or the International Crisis, or the, the International Refugee Committee is doing in this country. Let us show you what we're doing. We're feeding people. We're keeping people alive. We're doing this research. We're providing water. Help us. They go to foundations to get this money, to get the government money. And every time Congress, is, Congress says, oh, international money, you can't send it all overseas anymore, that gets a little bit smaller, and it's a little bit harder. And so their, their work gets a little bit more difficult. Um, they also have to compete a little bit for space within operations. If Mercy Corps wants to be able to say, we helped all those people in Haiti when those buildings came crashing down, when cholera followed. We helped them. They have to go there. They have to be on the ground and do the work. So they have to, one, be invited by the government, two, get the money to go in the first place, three, work with the coordination authority in the country to find a sector in which they're going to work, and they get all that stuff there. So there's a real competition at so many different levels. And the more collaboration you see here in Washington, uh, Mercy Corps is actually based in Portland, but the more the, the, they have a Washington office, the more collaboration you see here, the more cooperation you see and the less competition you see out there. It's, it's, it's not like they're going at each other tooth and nails or they're tripping each other coming out of the blocks but there really is a competition and money is really drying up, so it's important to watch that. So what are the opportunities for people in the United States government to work with non-governmental organizations in the field? It's, this is primarily a discussion of NGOs in Africa, but let's look at some stuff that's happening in other parts of the world that really affect your ability as a US government person to work with NGOs in the field. Um, in Afghanistan, the counterinsurgency operations in Afghanistan, the stabilization op operations in Iraq, you know, it seems that development and humanitarian aid organizations and the military, or the U.S. government more broadly, would have very, very similar goals. I mean, in a counterinsurgency, 
the military, the government, you know, we, the American government, we're, we're trying to change the perception and the loyalties of the local population, right? We're trying to convince them that, you know, not to support the insurgent, not just to support the Taliban, but to support the government who are our friends. And by cre we do that by creating conditions that make them think the government is competent, that we help civilians meet their needs so that the Taliban don't help the civilians meet their needs. And we're trying to encourage the population to leave the insurgents. Well, pretty often this means in places like Iraq, I know this was going on, I think it's probably still going on in Afghanistan, we go out and we give a brigade commander and the battalion commanders and the company commanders fists fulls of cash. And they go into the village and they say, where do you want the well? Where's the medical center go? And I've got a school on the truck, we're gonna set it up. And the guys in the village are like, cool. <laughs> Most excellent, which is a great thing. Because the development guys, the long-term development people, have been working around this village for 20 years. And the village guys gone into them every day and said, my kids need a well. My kids need a school. My kids need a medical center. And there's not enough money, or it takes too long, or there's a different program, that's not what this NGO is doing, or long-term stuff. It doesn't fit into the long-term development program that's been developed in this country. But the company commander, the brigade commander, the battalion commander, build it. So there are very similar goals. You're trying to, this military operation and counterinsurgency, the stabilization operation, is trying to raise the level of development in the community. The long-term development NGO, trying to raise the level of development within the community. Similar goals, right? Okay, we're gonna come back to that. NGOs that have been there for 20 years, they are local, they strive for local integration. Their job, in theory, really is to work themselves out of a job. To create the conditions that they're no longer needed. To give away intellectual capital to train the local populace, to give them the capacity to build the systems and the structures so that the, all the international people can go on or go on to the next place. So they are fully integrated into the community. They live on the ground, they speak the local dialects, they've been there 20 years. They don't have a 365 degree, or 365 day rotation. They go for two, three, four, five, six, ten 10 years. That gives you, the American, who comes in for your year or two years, excellent access if you can get to this person, if they're willing to talk to you. So you have to work on communications. You have to work on developing a relationship with them. So the, the opportunities are that you, you're going to have similar goals. They have local integration. And they have the long-term relationships that you have to build with. And what's the other side of opportunity? Challenges. Because it, it can't be that easy. There has to be challenges. So, on the face of it, remember we were talking about similar goals. You're both trying to raise the level of development within the community. But why does DOD want to raise the level of development? To further tactical and operational goals. To win the war. Why does the NGO want to raise the level of development in the community? To raise the level of development. There's nothing, there's no strategic objective beyond that. So you have somewhat dissimilar strategic goals. And winning the tactical war, winning the operational war, may not fit into the long-term development strategy that the development community or specific NGOs have built over this 20-year period or looking out another 20 years. So it's important to keep that in mind as you're talking to. They develop these long-term relations just to transfer this information, not to further the U.S. government's objective, and we're going to talk about that in a second. So what about communications? These guys know things you want to know. They know who the leaders are, who's trustworthy, who's been here the longest, who really is the Taliban guy. How are you going to get that information from them? Are they going to share it with you just because you got the American flag on your sleeve? No. 
You have to build a relationship with them. You have to build trust. You have to prove to them that your means, your methods, your way of going about your job, and your strategic goals work with them. You have to work with them. You have to provide them something. You're not going to let them into your operations center. They're not clear. They're not. You, and so I know you're not going to do this. You're going to show up at their, their compound, and the U.S. government people are going to pull up in four armored Humvees or MRAPs with a 50 cal at one end and a grenade launcher at the other. And everybody's going to get out like this with the guns, and they're going to say, go away. Because part of their view of the world is that they don't, they don't allow weapons on their compounds. They don't allow weapons inside their vehicles. They don't want to be associated with war fighting. So you've got to find a neutral place. Probably, it's probably going to be the OSHA weekly meeting. You've got to sit down with them. Some of them, are, as soon as you walk in in uniform, they're going to get up and walk out. Some of them will. We'll talk about that continuum of who's at one end and who's at the other in a few minutes. So you've got to get to know them. You have to build a relationship with them. You have to build trust. You have to understand what their what their framework for operations is. They will not work with you in a vehicle with weapons. They, they're not going to do it. It's part of the rules. They have a code of conduct, just like you do. Three main elements of the code of conduct for NGOs. And maybe uh, Milan is going to correct me on this, but in my view, the humanitarian imperative is the most important thing. It's a really simple idea. Provide assistance based on need alone. Somebody needs your help, you give it to them. Independence. You form your policy as an NGO independent of the government or independent of government action. Just because the government says, you know, if you feed that village, they'll be on our side, and they won't go to the Taliban, doesn't mean you should feed them. You should feed them only if, it's, if they have a, a real need. And neutrality, impartiality of provision. Even if that village supports the Taliban, if they need it, you're going to give them food. And that's going to drive the DOD back great. That is just absolutely, the DOD guy's going to go up the wall. But it's going to happen. Suppose you're trying to separate the, you know, the, the DOD guys out there, and he says, look, this village is giving food away to the Taliban. We know this. What's the NGO guy say? How do you know? Well, our intel tells us. You say, oh, stop, you can't tell them that. So you've got to find a way to work with these people. They're not clear. They probably are very suspicious of everything the United States government has to say, in many cases. You can't share everything with them. You've got to find a way to work. Give, take, give, take. Build that long-term relationship. And it's trust. Showing up at their compound. Their security is principally based on the idea of earning the trust of the local community. Not by winning the hearts and minds of the indigenous personnel through superior firepower. It's not always true, but specifically in Iraq and Afghanistan, it is. Military vehicles and soldiers with weapons violate the principles of neutrality. So you really have to be careful with this. The U.S. Institute of Peace and the Office of the Secretary of Defense have come up with a set of guidelines that you can download from the USIP website. And it's really, really helpful. It'll tell you how to best work with NGOs. And it'll tell you what these are already agreed upon principles by the Office of the Secretary of Defense and by the NGOs. Now, when I said that some NGOs really, really just will not work with you no matter how hard it is, you're going to find a continuum out there. In my experience, both Afghanistan, Iraq, and a number of countries in Africa, you can start at one end and think of an organization like CARE, CARE International. They're happy to have the security that the Defense Department or the U.S. government is going to provide. Somewhere at the far end of the spectrum is the French uh, food NGO called Action Contre la Femme. They will get up out of the room, they will get up out of their chairs and walk out of the room when the American military walks in, 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 in some countries. Maybe, maybe this is evolving. So somewhere along that continuum are the rest of the 
is the rest of the world. And again, this is all about building relationships. You need to like not show up at their combat. Get to know them. Find out who you can talk to. Find out who's interested in talking with you. And that's how you're going to build these developments. I suspect that you'll, you know, when you get in country, no matter who you work for, whether it's DOD, whether it's I saw um, uh, Department of Agriculture for foreign agriculture officers here, you're all going to have a different experience. And it's all going to be just like building any other relationship you've already built in your life, any other relationship you've already built in your career. First you build trust, and you go from there. Um, it's, it's hard earned, these relationships. They're very hard earned, and they're easily lost, but they are very, very valuable. The people that go and work under their code of conduct for 20 years in a country at the edge of the empire, because it's in their heart to do so. They're just as dedicated to their jobs as you are to yours. And they're just as professional about their work. There's winners and losers on all sides. So just that's what I would sort of finish with, is that they are just as dedicated to their work and their code of conduct as you are to yours. And uh, try and find a good piece of middle ground to work from. I guess that's it for me. Thanks.